We're going to be continuing. Got one over here. Continuing in our study in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 8. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time in Bible study. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you, Lord, and we ask that you would just open up our hearts and minds to receive what is in your word. Oh, Lord, we know <laughs> this is the last book. This is, this is the last word that you have provided to mankind, allowing us to be able to see that which is yet to come, that which will come to pass, moving towards the time of you establishing your kingdom on earth and in your kingdom for all of eternity. And so, Lord, we want to not only be good students, we want to be those who hear and those who accept and receive and then also those who share. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Last week, if you were here, we saw John take a parenthetical praise he, or, or pause. He paused between the opening of what was the sixth and the seventh seal of the scroll. The pause answered a question that we saw earlier given in chapter 6. The question, who is able to stand? The question against whom it would be, well, are those that were able to stand in the day of the Lord's wrath. And John identified two groups. You remember the first group that he identified were 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Those that would be supernaturally protected by God during the period of the tribulation and therefore come out on the other end unharmed. But during the entire time of this seven-year period, they would be sharing and spreading the word of God through his Messiah, Jesus Christ, to the world around him. And then there was another group, a group that would take a stand but wouldn't fare so well. A multitude of those who would take this stand but lose their life and be martyred for accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So the answer, who is able to stand, was answered in these two groups. As we move now into chapter 8, the pause is over. And with the opening of the seventh seal, there comes a dramatic change as we're going to see seven angels prepare to blow seven trumpets. And each trumpet will bring God's judgment poured out upon the earth and those who are inhabiting it. In chapter 8, we're going to see four of these trumpets. And their attention of God at this particular point in time is drawn specifically on the physical earth. And there's some things that we need to keep in mind. Whenever we study and we look and we see that which God is going to do, especially in this book, this book that reveals the coming Jesus Christ, the kingdom to come, that which is going to transpire, we have to do so recognizing and realizing that there's things in here that are hard. There's things in here that are, that are scary. The calamity that's going to be launched on the earth as God pours out his wrath is beyond anything that we can ever imagine. And as we look at what is described, we have to keep some things in mind. The first thing that we have to keep in mind is that these events that we're going to see are reserved for a Christ-rejecting world. Those who have refused to accept Jesus Christ, those that are on the earth after the church <laughs> has come up here after we've been raptured. Those who are going to experience these things are going to do so by choice. They're going to choose their defiance of God. They're going to do so of their own free will. And yet, those who are of the church, who by faith have placed their trust in Jesus Christ, we won't be here when any of this happens. So everybody say, okay, amen. amen. Yeah, we're not going to be here for these things. The other thing you have to understand, we don't have to make sense out of this. People for years have been looking at this and trying to draw it into what our modern cultural understanding of how these events can happen, how these things take place, what they mean, how it will take, take and shape out in relationship to the means by which the things that are given will happen. We don't have to know the why or the how. We only have to accept it as what is going to take place. And when we get caught up into this speculation, when we get caught up into trying to figure out how these things could possibly take place, it removes and it distracts us from the point that they're going to. And too many people want to tell you how it's going to happen rather than tell you why it's going to happen. And the reason why it's going to happen and, and the, the purpose and the what is that God at this particular point in time is pouring out judgment on a world that has refused to accept His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's what's truly important. The other thing that we need to understand is that we're going to continue 
Continue to let God's word say what God's word says. We're going to continue to say, let, let, let God speak, and we're going to take him at his word and understand also that the things that are being told to us, the things that are being shown to us, have been done so in order that we would be prepared. The things revealed in this book are meant to bring a blessing. We were told that this book brings a blessing to those who hear, to those who read, and those who follow the commands that are placed upon uh, or within the book upon us to, to do so. And we know that by doing so, we look at this and we say, well, how in the world can, can we look at the horror that's going to play out upon the earth and see it as a blessing? We see it in two ways. Number one, we know it's coming. How many of you love playing worst case scenario? If I can just know what the worst case scenario is, just tell me what's the worst case scenario. Because if we can backtrack from the worst case scenario, then we can start building a plan and a strategy on how to be able to deal with it. If I can know the absolute worst, but what's always around the corner from the worst case scenario? A new worst case scenario. So by virtue of the fact that we know that these things are coming, we know that they're part of God's plan, we know that this is what God has put into motion, then we don't have to enter in any type of means of fear in relationship to what is being revealed, what is, what is coming in this revelation. The other thing is, is that it provides us escape. So not only do we have the knowledge of what is going to come, but we also have the knowledge and the promise of escape. And so because of that, for the believer, as we look into these words, as we look into the descriptions of what's going to take place, we can do so with complete confidence that God's promise to cause us and to deliver us are, are yes and amen, as well as all of the things that we see happening are part of his plan. And nothing has been given over. And because we know that it's all part of God's plan, we don't have to be afraid. And yes, let me tell you what, what's going to happen is going to be beyond our imagination. It's going to be more so than anything that we can imagine as God's judgment is poured out and as Satan is going to be released to do evil in this world like never before. It's interesting when we think about how we, we look and we recognize and we realize that there's evil within this world. But guys, understand, right now, the evil in this world is being restrained. Our prayers, the power of the Holy Spirit, the fact that God is still working in the world through his church are part of that process of restraining the evil that is happening in the world today. The fact that we are here is part of that restraint. When we are gone, the means by which evil will be re reduced and evil will be held at bay are going to be removed. And we're going to see as we move, not this week, but next week, where all hell literally is going to break loose on earth as the bottomless pit itself is opened up. We know that for those that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, that again, we're not going to be here when this takes place. And we also know that in order for the establishment of Christ's kingdom to come on earth, in order for him to rule in righteousness, these things are going to happen. This isn't speculation. This isn't one of those things where it's like, this is what could happen. If we don't clean up our act, this is what's going to, no, no, this is going to happen on the face of the planet. This is going to take place. We have God's word on it. And so as we go through this, we need to recognize that there are going to be those that are left behind. And I, it's interesting because I have those from time to time ago, well, you guys, you Christians, you guys are going to all bail out and leave us here. And I'm going to, and it's going to say, yep. <laughs> yeah, but it's going to be your choice. Just as salvation is the choice for every individual, so too is whether or not you will be here if you are allowed to by virtue of life. To see this, you will have done so by your own choice because everyone is given the opportunity to be counted worthy to escape the wrath of God that is to come through Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Amen? The unbridled evil that will happen upon the earth during God's judgment is truly horrific. But yet, while we are still here, having a conversation the other day talking about when I think this is going to happen, I'm planning for it to happen to me individually within the next 30 or 40 years. Yeah, because I figured that's about as long as I, I'm going to get a run, if Lord willing. Probably about as long as I want to run. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I'm going to plan for the long run and I'm going to hope for the short run. 
But if we're planning for the long run, then it means that while we are here, before Jesus would yell and call us up and say, come up here, we need to be doing everything that we can to promote and to further the kingdom of God by virtue of offering salvation to anyone that will hear. To anyone that will hear. And so the things that we're about to read are there on purpose. Are they meant to scare? Boy, I hope so. I hope there are those that would literally be terrified of what is going to come to the point that they would listen to the means by which escape is offered freely through Jesus Christ. In verse 1 of chapter 8. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. As this seventh seal is open, a very, very unusual event takes place. There's silence in heaven. Now, you know, every picture that we've seen thus far of what John has seen of, of being portrayed, what's going on in heaven, is that there are angels flying through the air crying out, holy, holy, holy. The, the, the elders and, and those that are sitting around on the lesser thrones are falling down and there's worshiping. There's huge praise that is going before the throne. It's a noisy place. The throne of God is a, com is a complete, just, just wild scene going on of celebration and worship of Jesus Christ and of God Almighty as, as being the one who has authored all. And yet for this moment, in this place, everything is going to be eerily silent. It's going to be quiet. It's going to be a time in heaven where there's going to be a tremendous calm before the storm as they all observe in awe what's about to take place. Now, it's interesting. For those of you that knew him, Steve Harrison, before he went home to be with the Lord, remembered about five things. Alzheimer's had just, just ravaged him. But there were five things, and one of the things that, that, that was so cool about Steve is he never lost his joy for the Lord. He never lost his joy of his salvation, and that was a true blessing. But one of the things that he was absolutely certain of was that men got to heaven a half hour before women because there was a half hour of silence in heaven. But anyway, <laughs> moving on. And if you know Steve, he would tell you that every time he saw you because it was a new thing for him every time. Silence is a good thing. We've heard that silence is what? It's golden. Times of stillness in the life of a Christian is a very, very good thing. There's times when we need to be still. Times when we need to reflect on not only what God has done, but what God is going to do. We know that God is full of grace, that God is full of mercy, that he's patient, that he's slow to anger. We know that his desire is that none should perish. But guys, understand, there is a day that is coming when his patience will end and judgment will begin. And it's important that we have the right and proper understanding of both the grace of God and the justice of God in order that we can share properly with the world around us, especially for those who have a misconception of who God is, those who see only God as love without seeing God as being just, those who, who would think that somehow or another that, that, that God is not going to come to the place of judgment, don't know God. They don't know his word. They don't know what has been told and what has been prophesied and what will come to pass. And guys, if all of heaven is still over what is about to happen and what is about to take place, we should be very aware of the change that is about to happen. In Psalm 46 and 10, we're told to be still and know that I am God. But a lot of people don't go beyond that. Be still and know that I'm God. Okay, just be quiet. It works great when you're dealing with kids. Just be still. God's going to get you. No, did you, did you. There's another part of this verse that brings true understanding. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God is going to be exalted in the earth. Jesus Christ is going to be exalted in the earth. And there's a lot of folks that have no idea, no understanding of what this means. And while many see God as a concept and they think Jesus was a nice guy, great teacher, even, even somebody to, to follow after in relationship to the things that he said, what they don't realize is that he is the sovereign ruler of the universe, that he is God Almighty. And that there is a time that is coming, what they don't realize is Jesus is going to come back, and when he comes back to this earth, that he is going to rule it by force. 
by force. Oh, that sounds so harsh. Isn't it better if he just comes back and does it? He's going to come back. Look at what it says. Everybody turn with me to Revelation 19. Jump forward a little bit. We'll be there in about three months. Or maybe sooner. Revelation 19, verse 15. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule with a rod of iron and he himself treads the wine, wine press of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When Jesus comes back, he's going to establish his rule, and it says with a rod of iron. There's not going to be any, any more nonsense. There's not going to be any more, well, I think I could have, would have, should It's going to be you're going to do so because God Almighty is going to take and allow his son to rule in such a way that the world is forced into submission. And see, a lot of people don't want to talk about that. Well, it just sounds terrible. It doesn't sound like the Jesus that I, that I know. It sounds just like the Jesus that's going to have on his thigh written King of Kings and Lord of Lords and going to come back and going to take and establish rule and reign. And guys, this is what we have to understand. Once the judgment of man begins, the hope of salvation is going to start drawing to a close. The ability to receive Jesus as Savior is going to be replaced by the world facing him as a righteous judge and king. And this silence marks the transition as grace and mercy now start to move into the justice and judgment of God. Right now, we're blessed. I mean, right now, Guys, we are living in this dispensation, this time of grace. We're living in this tremendous grace and mercy of God. And I think we need to be reminded of that on a regular basis. I think we need to be reminded that there's this aspect of God that, that is, is, is so perfect, so sincere, so righteous that literally we can't stand in its presence with the exception of grace and his mercy. And I don't know how many times that I, 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 can, I can say this, and every time I say it, it just thrills me as, a, as I take it and make it a part of who I am, is understanding that grace is getting what we don't deserve. We're getting something we don't deserve. God has lavished us with the opportunity to be called his sons and his daughters through his son Jesus Christ and our faith placed within him. And by doing so, we get what we do not deserve. And it's by the grace of God. But then there's his mercy. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. See, I love the fact that we have got this whole process by which God will pour out and lavish in a free gift that which we don't deserve. And at the same time, the very things that we do deserve, he loves us so much and he's willing to put them off based on his love and his mercy that we can stand in front of him knowing that there's not anything that we're going to pay a price for because Jesus Christ has paid it all. The amazing grace and mercy of God should bring, though, to our understandings the contrast from what we have been delivered. It should allow us to be able to recognize the freedom that our salvation brings, the fact that we are free from everything that we see that is going to be poured out. All of heaven is, in, is still and in awe of the judgment that is about to happen upon the earth. And we, too, should stand in awe of what God has done and what he is yet to do. Look at verse 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God. And to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel, having a golden censure, came and stood at the altar. And he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. John looks now and he sees seven angels standing before the Lord. This is interesting because throughout Scripture, we're only given a, a glimpse of two angels that had the privilege of standing in God's presence. And that was Michael and Gabriel. You search the Scriptures out, you'll find that this is a very, very highly cherished position. And we know that they are the archangel Michael and, and Gabriel. It's the, they'll probably be two of these seven. I'm not sure who the other five are. But these have a special place of being able to stand in front of the throne holding these seven trumpets and being prepared to blow them in the ancient world trumpets were a way of communicating they were the cell phones of the ancient world 
Right? If you want to talk to somebody long distance, you blew a horn, you blew a trumpet because there wasn't any other way to communicate. When, when it was time to go to battle, a certain horn was blown in a certain pattern and told the troops to be able to muster. When it was time for somebody to move out or to an action to take place or an event, a horn was blown in a, in a significant pattern. The children of Israel in the wilderness, there was, there was horn blasts that told which tribe to move when. And now, as these angels prepare the trumpets that they will blow are going to start things moving upon the earth in an amazing way. But John says he also sees an angel holding a golden censer, serving before the throne, and he's doing so in the place of a priest because he's offering incense. And this was the, the place of the priest to offer up incense and offering the prayers of the saints. And we know that there are many references in, in Scripture to where it talks about how our prayers are like an incense that rises to heaven before the throne of God. That there's the, this, this literal accounting of all that we, that we offer to God in, in prayer goes up as an incense, as a fragrance before Him. And I love this picture. I love the picture that, it knows, that I know that none of the prayers that I, that I offer up are in vain. That none of the prayers that I offer go unheard. And I think all too often we think that they are. All too often we think that our prayers hit the ceiling and don't go anywhere further than that. Maybe God's not listening. Maybe he's too busy. I actually had somebody tell me once that based on how they approached their religious belief that one of the reasons that they prayed to other people was because Jesus was too busy. Jesus is so busy that we need to pray to somebody else in order to be able to get our petition before God. And I thought, man, I hope not. I hope that Jesus is never too busy to be able to hear the things. And according to what we see in Scripture, he's not. God never allows that which is offered to him in the form of our heart's prayer to go unheard. The problem is, is we think that so often that God maybe isn't listening, that God's upset with us, that maybe he is busy, maybe we're not praying right, maybe something's going on here. And look at 1 John 5 and 13. 1 John 5 and 13. It says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. I like that. And that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now listen. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. How many of you have heard that before in other ways? Now, whatever you pray for, God's, God's faithful to give it to you if you pray in his will. God wants to give us the desires of our hearts. He just wants the desires of our hearts to align with his heart before we ask. And there's a whole mess of bad doctrine out there where people talk about God just wants you to have everything that you want. No, God wants you to have everything he wants you to have. And as we align our hearts with him, we're going to see that happen. And it says, whatever we ask for, that's what's going to happen. John says we can have confidence that when we ask according to his will, that he hears us, and we have the petitions, the things we ask for, he's going to provide. But wait, somebody would say, Pastor, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I prayed for stuff, and it didn't, didn't happen. I mean, I offered a prayer, and I needed a job, and I needed healing, and I needed finances, and, and I needed a relationship restored, and God didn't give it to me. God didn't come through. God didn't answer my prayer. Understand, listen, God always answers prayer. He always answers prayer. Sometimes it's just not in the way that we expect. <laughs> prayer is not intended to change or direct the will of God. The idea isn't that we go to God and we pray hard enough to get him to agree with us or that we pray hard enough to change a direction that he has set for us in relationship to how somehow or another he'll come around a way to our way of thinking. And I tell you what, I, I don't know about you, but I prayed like that. God, you need to do this. And I've even thought in the back of my mind, knowing that it was wrong all the time, that well, with as much as I do, he should come through on this one. Anybody else besides me ever had that? part of nature we do god you should want this for me it's a good thing it's for you after all when jesus prayed to the father in the garden of eden he had no problem asking that the cup would be passed away that that which would lay before him would be taken away and removed is there another way to do this but yet he finished his prayer with not my will but thy will be done 
And guys, so often when we pray, we forget to add, Lord, this is what I want. But Lord, nevertheless, (laughs) your will, not mine. And so often we set ourselves up for failure because the only solution that we see is our solution. The only thing that we see as a means to the result of the prayer has to come in the way that we would recognize or that we want it fulfilled. And so because of that, we completely box God out in how he would want to work in order to fulfill it. We see a need or desire and we ask God to bring it about in the way that we want it to happen. And if the Lord doesn't answer it just like we laid it out, then we think that something has gone wrong, that God didn't answer. You know, it's been said, and it's very, very simple, and it's very, I believe, completely over simple, that God answers prayer in one of how many? Three ways. How many of you know him? Yes, no, and what? Wait. Yes. God sometimes answers a prayer. Yes. He does occasionally in my life, he's actually answered the prayer the way I prayed it. So it'd be really easy for me to think every once in a while, God gets it right. (laughs) I think it's the other way around. The key, though, is to trust him and be open to his answer and not limit him, realizing that he very often will say yes in a way that was totally different than what we thought yes would be. Often the Lord will answer yes in a way that reaches well beyond the impact of just our lives and what we could have imagined. Other times the solution may be so simple that we didn't see it. Sometimes this, the solution is just so simple. I mean, I've had people come to me and say, you know, I really need another job. My job is killing me. It's just not working. It's tearing me up. I don't like the hours. It's hard work. My, my family's suffering. It's, I, I just need a new job. And then the next day or a little while later, I get a phone call and they're, and they're crying on the other phone. I got fired. Is that what you wanted? No. I wanted a guy to get, I need this job. I need the money that I get. Well, job, God, maybe God thought that you needed more time to look for a job. Maybe God saw this and he thought, well, if you're that miserable in that job and you're right and it's not good for you and it's not what's working for your family because it's causing you to be away, then I'm going to open this up for you and I'm going to give you the opportunity to have a, a new and a fresh outlook and have opportunities for a new job. But the first thing I got to do is I got to cancel the old job. So there you go. But that's not what I prayed for. What we saw as a need for financial provision, the Lord saw as a need for faith and reliance. And so he decided to go ahead and do it his way. It's also possible that without knowing it, that it was meant to encourage somebody else. It meant, might mean that the trial that we are walking through, the faith that we have to now exercise and, and allow God to grow in order for us to move past the point in which we're in, is designed and dedicated to someone else's view. And we don't realize who's watching us. And yet I hear people talk about all the time, man, I can't believe what they're going through and just how strong they are in the Lord. And it encourages me to continue in my battle because I see the strength of the Lord working in their life. And the whole time they're going, man, I'm a wreck, man. I'm falling apart over here. This is crazy. This isn't what I prayed for. And God says, just hang on. And the plan that he has is so much greater than the confines of what we have texted it in in relationship to our ideal outcome. God sometimes says no. He just flat out says no. No. He always does so because he loves us. He always does so because he's protecting us. God's not telling us no because he wants to withhold something good. God tells us no because very often, even if it is going to have in the future a good outcome, we're not ready to handle it yet. There's times when we're not prepared, where we haven't done the work, if you will. We haven't done the the aspect of, of putting the time in in order to be able to make sure that we are prepared and capable and able to handle that for which we're even praying for. I'll have people come to me with this great big high lofty idea or something like that. And it's like, well, have you figured out what it's going to take to do it? Well, no, God's just going to come through. Well, before that would happen, don't you think that maybe you ought to go and, 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 and figure out how these things work? Oh, no, God, was God going to just give you like a miraculous download and all of a sudden in, in, instruct you on how to be able to do something that you've never done before that is so grand? And God says, no. <laughs> Lord, I want to do this. And God says, you're not ready. So for right now, it's not even a wait, it's a no. 
When our kids were growing up, there were things that they thought they were ready for before they were. And if you'd have asked them, they'd have told you, we're ready. And her mom and I would say, no. Sometimes we would tell them why, other times we wouldn't. We would just say, you just have to trust me. Because we knew that they weren't ready for the things that they were trying to put themselves into at that particular moment. And God does exactly the same things with us at times when he'll tell us no. God will also say no when we ask for something in the wrong way or when we ask for the wrong motives. James 4 and 2 says, You lust and you do not have. You murder and you covet and you cannot obtain. You fight and you war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. We like that part. And you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Motivation is always a factor in how God answers prayer. Motivation is always a factor. And often we need to reevaluate why it is that we're asking for something and why it is that we're, that we're looking for God to do something and make sure that our heart is aligned with his will. Asking amiss, though, doesn't always mean that we're just asking from selfish motives, that we're just wanting something for ourselves. It can also mean that we're asking for something that doesn't fulfill the plan of God. It may be that we're wanting to do something that is thwarting a work that God's doing somewhere else, and God says, no, don't do that. I'm working on this. There's times when I've prayed for people and I've, and I've thought about the things that I can do to potentially assist them in the place that they're at, and God has specifically said, no, don't do that because I'm doing a work over here. I'm doing something in their life. I'm doing something that's going to bring them to a place of realizing their need. And if you get in the way of it, you're going to mess it up. And God will tell us no. Then everybody's personal favorite, wait. You guys already know that I am not a good waiter. My wife is always saying that patience is a virtue, and I'm just like, then I have none. And yet the adage that anything worth having is worth waiting for is still true. And when God tells us to wait, again, it's not meant to create frustration. It's not meant to just withhold something that is, is, is good for us. God doesn't say wait because he's unable to make a decision. God wants us to wait because it's a means of growing us. Isaiah 40 and 31, one of my and most people's favorite verses. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But man, we hate to wait. Oh, that wasn't added. I added that. But when we wait on the Lord, we have to learn to trust Him and, and do so in that which we cannot see. And that builds faith and it builds ways in, in our lives that we could never achieve if we didn't have to wait on the Lord. We also find that there's times when it seems like the Lord is making us wait. And this is one of my favorite, favorite places to mess up. Because like you, I can do things wrong. I will think God is making me wait when in reality he's already given me the answer. I just don't like it. He's already told me what the answer is. He's already told me what it is that he wants me to do. But I'm going to keep praying for a different solution and call it God causing me to... I'm, I'm just waiting on the Lord on this. Well, didn't God already tell you? No, God didn't know. God, God mentioned something in his word about that, but I'm not, I'm not standing on that promise. I'm going over here and looking for a new... <laughs> and we do this all the time because we don't like the answer, because we don't want, want that which God has, 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 has already told us. We think that somehow or another that we're now waiting for a different answer. Let me tell you what, God will never answer with a yes or a wait that which he has already declared in his word to be a no. Never going to happen. God is never going to take, no matter how hard you pray for something that he has already identified as a no in his word, he's never going to re reevaluate it and come back with a yes or a wait. And yet I find people all the time that say, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord. Well, brother, God's already said, don't do that. Well, I know, but I'm just waiting on the Lord anyway. No, you're not. You're just being disobedient. You're just allowing your will to try to overrule God's will, and you're using this aspect of, of waiting on the Lord so that you sound spiritual. But it's not spiritual, it's disobedience. But folks, remember, the Lord hears all of our prayers. They rise before His throne, and they do so as incense. And as we pray, Lord, Your will be done, we'll see it made manifest.
In verse 5, it says, And the angel took the censer, and he filled it with fire from the altar, and he threw it to the earth. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The silence that was is now broken as this angel takes and he throws the incense and the prayers of the saints back to the earth. And there's noise and there's thunders and lightning and earthquake. And this is an incredible scene because everything has just changed. No longer are the prayers of the saints rising to heaven. No longer is there, is there the voice of the martyrs crying out to the Lord and emanating in praise. The prayer for his presence and his return that God would take control is now being established on the earth. And that which we have prayed for, Lord, come and establish your rule and reign, it's now beginning. And the first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and the third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The first four trumpets bring judgment, and each one of them will be against the natural earth. The first trumpet brings hail and fire and blood. And it says that a third of the earth's vegetation was burned up. Now, there's those that like to say, oh, this is, this is just not to be taken literally. This is symbolic. I don't see anything symbolic in this whatsoever. What I see is a declaration that at this particular point in time, when this angel sounds, when the first angel sounds, that one-third of the earth's vegetation is going to be wiped out. On an earth that already is suffering famine and disruptions and is already going through a, a period of just devastation based on the exodus of the church and based on the establishment of Satan and his rule in, through the Antichrist. And so Already now things were bad. Now they've just gotten incredibly bad. We can't even imagine what it would look like for one-third of the earth's vegetation to be wiped out instantly. We have, no, we have no measuring. We have no means of being able to identify this. And when the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, the third of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. It says, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. For years, the scientists have been telling us and forwarding a, theater of a, or a theory of a, a meteor or an asteroid hitting the earth. In more recent years, we've seen this great fascination with this theory of a doomsday rock. This asteroid, this planet killer asteroid that's going to strike the earth, declares the Discovery Channel. What we see here could be something like that. It could be. But it doesn't have to be. <laughs> oh, see, once again, if we go on a search for meaning and if we try to make this align with our understanding that we're taking God and putting him into our understanding and trying to make him operate within our realm rather than his... And to do so only leads to speculation. And while it might make for a great book or a movie, the reality is, is it doesn't make any difference. How? <laughs> the how, once again, is not important. The fact is, is that one-third of the Earth's vegetation is going to be gone. One-third of the sea is going to instantly be destroyed. And one-third, it says, of all the ocean-going vessels are going to be destroyed. That's what's going to happen. And then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on, a, on the springs of water. And the name of the star was Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. The third angel sounds, and a star falls from heaven, and the fresh water is attacked. And we know water is the key to life. You could live for weeks and even months without food. Well, a little over a month. But you can live three days without water. And that's why whenever there's a calamity, whenever there's an emergency, a natural disaster, one of the first things that's mobilized is water, drinking water. 
But here we see that the fresh water is struck and it says that many more are going to die. We don't have the numbers right now, but we, we already know that the world is suffering great loss through the exodus of the church, through those that were died who died instantly in the process of the taking over of the Antichrist, and now even more are dying. I'm going to throw it out there just because it's interesting trivia. The Russian word Chernobyl is translated wormwood. How many of you heard that? (laughs) Uh Then that means that what this must be, these have to be nuclear missiles being spread out. You know what? No, they don't. It could be. I mean, historically what the word wormwood describes is a bitter and poisonous water. Speculation says that, yes, this falling star could be nuclear missiles, but again, it's not said what it is that makes its importance or or how it happens. It's what has taken place that we need to be realizing and familiar with. Does God need to use an invention of man in order to be able to strike his creation? (laughs) No. This could be a star falling from heaven that he chooses to strike the water with. The fourth angel sounded in verse 12. And a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, and a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. Thirds. A third of the vegetation, a third of the sea, a third of the fresh water, and now a third of the sun and the moon and the stars, it says, are blotted out. Again, there's been great speculation as to how this could be and what the cause of this. And some of them sound great. Some of them make sense. You can fit them into a scientific model. The events are very similar to what could happen in the aftermath of a collision with a great asteroid hitting the surface of the planet and throwing dust up into the air and launching us into into some sort of, of ice age based on the blotting out of the sun. Well, it could also be what the movie script writers like to refer to as nuclear winter. If there was a nuclear attack that took place across the planet, that the same effect would happen is that there would be this cloud that would rise up and blot out the sun and blot out the moon. And we know a little bit about this because of our smoke season around here, about just what it's like. I mean, you you can't see the sun. You can't see. So, So, yeah, there's natural means by which this could happen. But again, I'm not really concerned about the the how this is going to take place, I'm only concerned with the fact that people need to understand it's going to take place. There's others that have talked about, oh, the polar shifts. Did you see the movie? You heard it? Where what's going to happen is is that the earth is going to change its axis, and what's going to happen is is that the North Pole is going to the South and the South Pole is going to the North. I'm just thinking we're going to be in on beachfront property one way or the other here in Nevada, and I'm okay with it. We need to stop any focus on the how it's going to happen. Place our minds and our hearts and our understanding on the what is going to happen so that it will cause us to take and to share with people that escape that is available through Jesus Christ. Right? And it's fascinating. There's some really cool stuff out there. You can go out and research it. And there's, there's guys that are way smarter than me that have studied this stuff, the scientists, and they say, this is what could happen. This is what this could take place. And we're going to see some of this next week when we talk about what's coming, because, boy, people like to speculate what things are if they can't understand what Scripture has called them to be. But he says, I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet and of the three angels who are about to sound. So just about the time when you think things couldn't get any worse. John now sees an angel flying through the sky announcing that the worst is yet to come, that there's more coming. The worst case scenario just got worse. That we try to figure this out, but we need to understand that those that are on the earth are going to experience this, those that are remaining. The first four trumpets of this judgment has been on the natural areas in the land, the sea, and the skies. And the things that people are about to see are going to be when the demonic is unleashed. Next week in the study, we're going to see something that is just beyond all imagination when the demons that have been chained will be released to do what they 
have not been allowed to do on the face of this planet. And no one's going to be able to hide from the evil that's about to come when Satan is allowed to open the bottomless pit and release all hell on planet Earth. And so the question is simple. Okay, Pastor, great message. We're really feeling encouraged tonight. What are we supposed to do with this information? What are we supposed to do with this? Now that we know, and okay, we're going, we're backing up to the, all right, we know that by knowing it's a blessing and by having escape it's a blessing, but what are we supposed to do with this right here and right now? I mean, it's bad enough. The world is messed up enough as it is. I mean, the last thing that I ought to do is go out and tell people that are already under all of this stress from how messed up the world is, hey, but wait, there's more. It's going to get worse. But guys, it's exactly what we need to be willing to do. God has told us these things so that we would be without fear, that we would stand firm upon his promise of salvation, but that also we would be able to properly share his word with those around us. That we would take and be that aspect of... People want to see hope. They want to see it. I mean, people want to be encouraged. Because if we ever had a reason to be encouraged, it's because we know Jesus Christ and because we know the plans that he has for us. We know that his plans are to prosper us, not to defeat us. We know that he is going to take and call us to his side. We know that at some point in time when things are so bad that the, the church shouldn't be here that it won't be. But in the meantime, we also know that everything that we need in order to be able to live life now in the present as victors has been provided to us. We should be the happiest people on earth. I mean, we should. We know what's coming, and we know that we won't be here for it. Yeah. And guys, this is going to be a theme as we continue to go through this. I want you guys to understand as believers, if the world is going to see something that is of value to go after, they're going to have to see the peace that is in our heart that's provided by our stance and our position and our clear acceptance and reliance upon Jesus Christ. If they see that in us, it's going to cause them to want it. If they don't see it, what's the point? I get so, so worried when I hear, well, yeah, you Christians, man, you guys are the biggest bunch of complainers and groaners and gripers of anybody. Stop it. We don't have any reason to complain and gripe and groan. Okay, so we don't get what we want. Not now, but we do in the end. And God's got a plan, Amen. Having a proper understanding of how bad things are going to be without Jesus will allow us to be able to have a proper presentation of how good they are with him. And that's the goal. So Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. And Lord, we come before your throne of grace. And Lord, we, we know that as we look at these things that they're difficult, that they're hard. And Lord, there, there's so much going on here and yet, Lord, you've told us that for those that hear these words, for those who read these words, for those who follow these commands, that there is a blessing. A blessing that comes through our knowledge that all is in and under your control, that all is going exactly as you have prescribed. And that, Lord, because of your Son, Jesus Christ, we can be counted worthy to escape the wrath that is to come. But Lord, until that time, <laughs> may we be those who speak up at every turn. May we be those who will challenge this world to look at what's coming, to look at what's taking place and recognize and realize that this is just the beginning of that which is to come. Placing our faith and encouraging others also to place our faith in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.